Oh, Brandon. Can you hear me? Oh, yep. Oh, there you are. Well, I got a <laughs> bunch of internet tabs open. There we go. Oh, okay. You guys in your fancy background. Oh, you like that? Huh? Yeah. I like the smoothies with Rufus t-shirt. And in your honor, we have a smoothie today. It's a special oh. smoothie. It's one, it's one I brought out of uh, retirement. I used to give this to my girls when, oh. they, were, when they were young. It's eggs, in or, raw oh, eggs no. and orange juice. Oh my gosh, no. And they loved it. I don't know if he's serious or not right now. <laughs> he is absolutely serious and it was disgusting. Oh my, my goodness. I used to make him drink it every morning. Raw they were the Hulkamania drinks. Huh? Hulkamania drinks. Yeah, so so he mixed it up. It's like Orange Julius. If you ever had one of those, it's frothy. Oh, Rufus, did you make them go run through the Arctic right after they drank that, and like carry logs up hills? Eventually. Oh yeah, yeah. I used to have them do that. Sure, <laughs> of course. Oh my goodness. I, oh, Wait, no. is that seriously what's in your smoothie right now? Do what? That's seriously what's in your smoothie right now? Yeah. Oh my goodness. It, it's gonna be the rage. That's worse than the orange juice and olive oil smoothie you had a couple weeks ago. No, it's not. Orange it's juice and good. olive oil. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Rufus, I went uh, a little more traditional. I have the, uh, the espresso in the finest oat milk that Kentucky can provide smoothie. <laughs> I like it. I like you it. Got a smoothie King Pineapple Surf. Mm. There, there you go. So Smoothie King, if you see this, sponsor us. We need money. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you're working on. Uh, yeah, do you want me to start like back up a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, you should tell us uh, science. Tell us who you are first too. So our yeah. viewers know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not the, uh, when we started emailing about this, I suppose I'm not the typical Smoothies with Rufus guest. Um, so the way I know Rufus and I, Corey, I'm sure we've met in person, at least in passing or at a dinner or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I did uh, my bachelor's and then a master's in exercise science kinesiology. Um, and through that process, ran into Lance. Um, Goiki, who worked at IFAST at the time and now does online training somewhere, uh, doing whatever Lance does. Um, so yeah, I interned at IFAST just kind of by happenstance of Lance was TAing for a course I was in. And he was, I was like, hey, I got to find an internship. You know anywhere? And he's like, oh yeah, there's this place I like volunteer at, kind of work at called IFAST. I'd never heard of it. Um, and I was like, oh, sure. Like I got to work somewhere for this internship. Um, and just happened to work out that, you know, Bill and Mike and Ty and Jay and everybody there were really driven and really smart. Um, and then from there, I had gotten into PT school. Um, and the few schools I got into, they told me the price. And I said, nope, not doing that right now. Uh, and then from there, kind of took a gap year worked in a lab or two, uh, kind of got into some basic neuroscience research um, and really enjoyed that and was still kind of training people in that time. Um, and I enjoyed that a lot more than I did, you know, training with or working with people or potentially being a PT. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I applied to a bunch of neuroscience programs um, with an interest in you know, neurotrauma specifically. And that's what I do now. I'm a fourth, almost fifth year PhD candidate um, at the University of Louisville. I work with our spinal cord injury research group. Um, one of the, my favorite things about the group here and the main reason I came here out of all the schools I got into is literally in the building I'm in right now, we have all of our basic science research. So like animal research, um, cells and dishes type research, drug discovery stuff. And then right across the street, we have our whole clinical research facility and hospital, uh, which specializes in spinal cord injury. 
so we're able to, to meet with that group as well and kind of try and merge and think through these hard scientific and clinical problems um, from both sides, of it, from a very basic mechanistic standpoint, all the way up to, hey, what should my physical therapist be doing with a spinal cord injury um, that has this type of function? Um, how can, and then how can we have that crosstalk between, okay, this is what they're seeing clinically. How does that influence what maybe we should be researching um, here in more basic science type questions? Yeah, so I do neuroscience all day, all night. Uh, that's it. We can talk about more exactly what I research, but yeah, I research spinal cord injury and um, I do it in small rodent models. Awesome. Really cool um, stuff. Tell me, you know, I've talked about this before, but tell me how the, the brain and the spinal cord work together to learn something. Yeah, yeah, we can. I'll give a big broad strokes and then Corey or Rufus, if you have questions, we can go into some more details. Uh, so if you guys or anybody goes on YouTube and looks up a decerebrate cat, I'm certain I've showed Rufus this video before. But if you go and you disconnect the brain or the brainstem from the spinal cord and you throw a cat on a treadmill, that cat will still run on a treadmill, right? Which tells us that all of the circuitry needed for locomotion is housed completely within the spinal cord, right? You don't need a brain or a brainstem for that. Uh, there's, again, this is a big broad strokes type of thought. So if we take that, you know, these typical rhythmic movements can be completely controlled with the spinal cord. Uh, the next layer on top of that is something uh, you'll either hear called muscle synergies or motor primitives with the idea that, hey, we only have so many ways in which we can move joints together in a meaningful way, right? So if I'm going to reach to grab my coffee, I only need to move my hand, arm, uh, fingers in a certain way. And that kind of gets wired together in the spinal cord, right? Which might be a great thing if I'm a great baseball pitcher. I want those things to wire in my spinal cord together. Uh, but if I've also had, you know, terrible coaching and these movements have been, or these, you know, these joints being wired together uh, for movement purposes has been poor because I had a bad coach or someone that didn't know what they were doing. And, you know, that's harder to overcome, right? So I think if we go from the spinal cord having, you know, the circuitry all in the spinal cord for these typical movements, plus these muscle synergies or motor synergies that, you know, hardwire or hardwire uh, movements of joints together within limbs. The next layer of that is if we start to bring in the brain stem and the brain, right? Uh, so at least in humans and in higher primates, uh, we think of the cortex as like the motor cortex of the brain uh, as having put two broad roles. Um, one is it can connect directly to motor neurons. So the neurons going out to muscles to tell them to, hey, it's time to fire, um, which could be helpful if I need to, you know, correct a small movement or I want to move just this finger. Um, that's probably pretty cortically driven in humans. And the other role, rather than just controlling these fine single muscles, um, is kind of this intent of the motor cortex. So if we have this intent, uh, our current model is, hey, there's this intent, let's say, to start walking or to throw a baseball or whatever that movement is. Uh, and the motor cortex says, hey, spinal cord, let's do this. The spinal cord just gets that information of it's time to do this thing. And then the spinal cord takes it from there. Um, again, those are big, broad strokes, but that's kind of how our hierarchy of movement is thought about right now, um, both on the clinical side of our research and in the, the basic science mechanistic side of stuff. Brandon, can we kind of bridge this into your research specifically and how that model relates to what you're doing and how that can impact people with spinal cord injuries through your rodent models you're looking at? Yeah, yeah. So there, 
or we can go a couple ways on that. Um, so right, the big difference, and this is maybe, a, I don't want to say a downfall of science and basic research, but like as scientists, we have to know the limits of what we're doing, right? I can't say, hey, look, you know, drug A cures spinal cord injury in rats. I don't know why, so let's give it to humans. Um, like we have to know the limits, right? So one of those limits for us studying locomotion um, is rats walk on four legs, right? Unless you're Tony Giuliano, you don't walk on four limbs anymore, right? Uh, so we are we walk upright. Um, some of the anatomy is a bit different in the spinal cord as well, just where the, the tracks run within the white matter of the spinal cord can be a bit different. Um, but then there's also really good parts of that, of having rodent models, right? Uh, I can get deeper into mechanisms and looking at neural pathways. The injury and the inflammation is very similar, excuse me, between larger rodents like rats, um, or we have some people here that you know, do larger animal research, even larger than rats. Um, and that injury is very, very similar to um, the human injury and what it looks like. <clears throat> Sorry, Corey, what was the initial question? I kind of went off. Well, so how does the current model you just described relate to what your research is and how you're interpreting that research and how you're using it to help people with spinal cord injuries? Yeah, so understanding these differences and kind of the limitations, um, we can take what we find in rodent models and say, hey, this is what we might think. And if it is a pretty good finding in a rodent, um, we can say this at least gives us an idea of what might happen in humans. So let's move forward from there. Um, within this hierarchy of, you know, the spinal cord has all of the circuitry within it to produce movement, um, at least these stereotypic like walking type movements. And then the cortex and the brainstem say, hey, let's do this, spinal cord takes over. Um, so what we're really focused on now is if we still think that the spinal cord has all of these properties and circuitry within it to produce walking and stepping, um, how, why don't people still walk and step? right after a spinal cord injury. So if you take somebody that has a spinal cord injury and you put them in zero gravity or you give the legs enough support to where it is zero gravity and you give their lower part, their lumbar spinal cord um, enough input, electrical input of some sort, guess what their legs do in zero gravity? They start taking off and they're walking, right? So all that circuitry is still there just like we thought based on our animal model. Um, but why can't they take off now, right? And there's a few reasons as to why. One, the, that cortical signal, like all the way from the brain might be disrupted depending on the type of injury um, to where just that go signal isn't getting far enough down into the lumbar spinal cord, which controls the legs to say, hey, it's time to go, right? Um, the other possibility is Right, if you think about proprioception and feedback from a movement, um, even though those, those descending brain pathways are disrupted after an injury, same thing, that sensory information coming back up to the brain and the brainstem to inform it what the heck the limbs are doing or the outcome of that movement are also likely disrupted. Uh, so now it is a, a matter of figuring out one of two things. How can we either regrow ascending neurons to tell the brain and brainstem, hey, here's what the legs are doing. Here's the outcome of what we just tried to do. Um, we can try and uh, regrow or put in stem cells or something to get that cortical signal past the injury. Or uh, the approach that I've taken to kind of look at more, saying, hey, rather than getting things to regrow, there's a lot of reasons I think this regrowth of neurons isn't the greatest idea. Um, saying, hey, we know that the, the circuitry in the spinal cord can still do this stuff, right? If we think back to those people putting them in zero gravity, give their spinal cord a little stimulation and their legs start going, okay, they can still do this. How do we use the remaining circuitry in the spinal cord and the projections down from the brain and the brain stem? Can we change those enough to now learn to reuse what is there, right? So rather than trying to fix the whole 
from the spinal cord injury or the cavity? How can we use what's there still? And you know, this idea of neuroplasticity is at the heart of it. Um, how can we make what's there plastic enough to figure out how to do this movement given this new circuitry or this lack of circuitry from where that hole is? All right, and it's really similar to a similar concept to what you know you guys do as coaches or PTs of even though there's not a an injury to the spinal cord or the brain of figuring out hey how do I use what is here uh, and get the actual movement that I want or get whatever it is learn how to to do a snatch or something uh, so really the same concept I just have a, a massive hole in the spinal cord that's disrupting that even more so than you know you all would as clinicians or coaches yeah, and so you can deep dive a lot more into this just because of the setting you're in, in terms of how the nervous system works on a, I guess just a deeper level in terms of the layers you can kind of go through. Mm -hmm. Have you found anything surprising that has kind of gone against conventional wisdom in terms of how the nervous system works, how adaptable we are, and how the how neuroplastic these changes can actually be? Yeah, I'll plug a little bit of our own findings, and then we can keep going elsewhere and truck through that. Uh, so part of what we thought, and there's a few studies that will confirm this, and then our study goes the exact opposite and says the opposite thing now, uh, which is, again, the fun of figuring out science. It's really complex. So we have, if you think of, you know, you have this, if I had the spinal cord and I'm looking down the tube of the spinal cord, right? This is my spinal cord. Um, and, you know, that I have an injury here in my spinal cord. If you look, most spinal cords aren't complete, or most spinal cord injuries aren't complete. So like you haven't actually cut the spinal cord. It's more of a like blunt trauma. So a hole or a cavity develops in that area. But on the outside, there's still axons and connections running up and down there, right? So it's not completely severed. Um, so I think probably five years ago or so, if you would have asked, almost every spinal cord injury researcher, hey, these axons and these pathways that are intact on the outer edges here, where the cavity hasn't developed from the injury, um, are those good or are those bad, right? And we typically think, hey, if there's tissue that's spared, that is unharmed, that tissue is probably gonna be a good thing and we should try and harness it. Um, so we have, I'll stay out of the deep virology bits of this. Um, but we have a system where if my injury was here, I can inject one virus into the cervical spinal cord and one virus into the lumbar spinal cord. Uh, and they're not viruses that cause sickness, like we're not injecting a coronavirus or HIV or something. Um, but they deliver their genetic material and their genetic material does nothing in our animal, right? until we give them a antibiotic in their drinking water and that allows virus number one that was injected up here to interact with virus two that was injected down there and that actually causes those neurons that have both viruses to be silent now okay so the big picture you got to have two viruses give them some special drinking water and that makes neurons silent right with the idea that if we turn these neurons off we can see exactly what they do related to locomotion or reaching to grab food or whatever it is. So having that technique, we said, hey, we have these axons that are spared after an injury. Um, that, you know, they, they're not in that cavity or the injury area. So if we turn them off and they're neurons that are still there, we thought that our rats would get worse, right? We thought we would have we had spinal cord injury rats. They can't really move their back legs. They just kind of drag them along. Uh, their front legs just kind of pull the rest of their body along. <clears throat> and much to our surprise, when we silenced those neurons, the rats looked like they didn't even have spinal cord injuries, right? Which goes against all convention that we would have thought at the time five years ago or so of, hey, if we have neurons that are still there, let's try and keep them alive and make them even happier to do their whatever job they can do now. Um, and we found that, you know, shutting these neurons off that could be useful, and they're set up anatomically to be very useful, um, makes the rats better. Like, which to me is, I mean, it's a really cool finding, but I'm not gonna go stuff viruses in humans all of a sudden. Um, 
I don't think uh, we would get approval to do that. But it, the moral of that is like how little we still understand, right? Uh, that's the my biggest takeaway from that is like every neuroscientist that you would have talked to that studies spinal cord and spinal cord injury would have said, don't shut these neurons off because it's going to make them worse. Uh, and we were all wrong, which shows us how little we understand us still about all this stuff. Any ideas as to why shutting those off actually helps the rats in terms of being able to walk? Yeah. So, Corey, I'll come back to that, and I want to add just a bit in. Um, so the hospital side of this, the human research side, what they do is they go in and they implant these tiny little electrodes. We have a couple of great surgeons that do this right on the spinal cord where it's not injured. Um, and in those people, these are, they have some patients that are like 10 years after a spinal cord injury. Uh, when you turn those little electrodes on and you get them working the right way and the right electrodes in that array working at the right time, those people can start to move their feet again. They haven't moved their feet in 10 years, right? And then the same people, you give them the right amount of uh, like physical therapy rehab and you give their spinal cord that little stimulation um, in the right way, they can start to walk again. Now, it doesn't look like you or I walking around, like strolling down Fifth Street, but they're taking steps on their own and they could get from here to the restroom, right? Uh, which is a big deal. So again, this all seems like, hey, we're stimulating stuff similar to where our rats, where we silence these neurons, but now stimulating these neurons in people seems to make, not these exact neurons, but the area where these neurons are, like makes people better. So again, it's kind of like how little we actually know still with this stuff. Um, so my idea, I have three ideas, because this is a really good question. And anytime I talk about this, whether it's with therapists or other scientists, this comes up. Um, so there's a few, three main ideas of, okay, we had these neurons that start here and go here and the injuries right here. Um, and their axons still run on the outside of that injury area. Um, but those axons are myelinated still. Um, and after an injury, that myelin gets, gets disrupted and eventually starts to reform, but it never reforms to what it looked like in an uninjured neuron. Um, so there's a potential that, excuse me, uh, this myelination isn't as good anymore on these neurons. So their ability to send very precise timed signals is just completely thrown off. Uh, the next part is that perhaps those neurons start to recognize that, hey, the myelin going up where my axon wants to go is disrupted. And they say, I can't really send a signal anymore. So let me try and make some new axons below the injury. And that gives us a, a signal to noise problem of, we may have neuroplasticity where there's new pathways forming, uh, but that may just be bad pathways. It might be terrible neuroplasticity that's occurring now, um, which raises our noise in our system, our locomotor walking system, and decreases the signal, right? Which is, again, bad neuroplasticity. Um, the last potential, which is what I'm really working on now, which is the most likely, in my opinion, is that there's a bunch of other sprouting that occurs. So other neurons trying to make other connections after an injury, because there's so much disruption um, of all these pathways that things try to regrow and reconnect to something that might look promising for them connect, to connect to. Um, so my best guess is that all of these sensory neurons coming back in, whether they're coming from muscle sensing neurons or they are pain receptive neurons or joint receptive or skin receptive um, that they're sprouting. And again, making bad sprouts and bad connections, which again gives us a signal to noise problem. Uh, now I have bad connections, it's too much noise. And then my signal drops down and now my spinal cord doesn't know what to do. So when we silence these neurons, we get rid of some of that noise. So we drop the noise down, maybe we increase the signal just slightly 
and that gives that uh, animal the ability to walk now. Um, so it's a balance between good and bad plasticity after an injury. And then another project I have that I'm working on is chronically after an injury, how can we restart plasticity to make it good again? Uh, yeah. You kind of just described training there where it's like you have a specific <laughs> task you want to execute. Yeah. There's a million or you have a specific task in a certain way you want it executed depending on the context. There's a million different ways a task could be executed. So your goal as a coach is to set up the environment to get the execution or the desired outcome for that task to get that skill to be learned or refined or whatever your, your goal is. So it seems like it's a similar concept here, but there's a lot more noise in the system because there was such a big disruption and the axons mm -hmm. as a resprouting don't know where to go. And so do you think there's an advantage to, with these spinal cord injuries, doing something like this really early on before the axons have time to reform in ways that may not be advantageous? Yeah, so this is, I don't work on this, but a few other graduate students in one of the labs I'm in work on this. Um, we have, I think they have collaborators somewhere in Canada now too to help with this, uh, right? So with the idea that we have this massive spinal cord injury and there's all this rewiring neuroplasticity that starts to occur because stuff died off, things are trying to reconnect wherever the heck they can, which gives us again, more noise and not enough signal. Um, so the idea is that after the injury, there's a lot of plasticity occurring, but patients typically are bedridden, right? They're in the hospital, they probably have other traumas. They may have broken bones from a car accident. They may have some head trauma as well. Uh, they may have I'm trouble breathing, whatever it is. So clinically, again, this is the nice part about having the hospital literally across the street is a patient has a spinal cord injury, they have to have surgery, they're getting trauma treatment, whatever else, which, I mean, they could be bedridden, not even trying to move for three weeks to a month, but that's the time that all this plasticity in the spinal cord and brain are occurring, but there's nothing to tell these new connections, what's good and what's bad. Um, so part of what the other students are working on is, hey, if we get people three, four days after their spinal cord injury, uh, we're not gonna throw them into like heavy physical exercise, but can we like set up a bike in the patient's bed basically, like a recumbent bike. And even if they're not pushing, but just giving the sensory feedback of the legs moving together cyclically, can that start to tell you know, these new neurons that are not new neurons, these new sprouts of neurons um, that are trying to form and make new connections. Can that tell them, hey, these connections are good. Look, you're getting feedback from the legs moving similar to what they normally do. Uh, and then say, hey, these new other connections aren't doing anything right now. Get rid of them because they're just extra noise. Um, yeah, so that's definitely a, a very important question, right? You can take that same thing and say, Rufus, has definitely experienced this, where I have a younger kid, maybe who hasn't had any training before, we know that the younger nervous system is really adaptable to change. And if this kid has never had another coach teach him how to squat or start to do snatches or whatever, right? If Rufus gets them early, he can make these pathways that are, again, really plastic in children. Um, Rufus can take them and say, hey, here's the right way to do this. Here's the right inputs, right? Even though it's not a spinal cord injury patient on a bed three days after an injury cycling, Rufus is doing the same thing, right? He's trying to increase the right signal and decrease the noise. Uh, and if I'm sure you guys both have had, you know, patients or clients that, hey, this guy did CrossFit for, I don't know, 10 years and his CrossFit coach just saw him do a snatch and the bar went over his head. And now for Rufus to try and fix that is a whole nother ball game to try and do. Right, so it's literally the exact same thing. Ours is just, I want somebody to be able to move their feet again so they can take steps. And your guys' is, is, let me get 500 over my head, yeah. So what's actually happening at the level of the nervous system that makes it so difficult to break those patterns that have been going on for years and years and years? <clears throat> yeah, there's a few things. 
Um, so we'll start with just connection to connection first, right? So if let's say neuron A connects to neuron B, we'll take a very simplistic view of this. And neuron A connecting to neuron B means that I hit the right position in the bottom of my squat, let's say, right? Uh, but if neuron A connects to neuron C, that means that this pathway, maybe I shift to the right just a little bit when I hit the bottom of my squat or whatever it is, right? Whatever thing you don't want to occur. So if I have a good coach like you all, and I say, Rufus says, hey, did that feel right? And I go, no, you know, I, I felt my weight a lot on my heels or I really felt a lot of weight on this side or I didn't feel this muscle or whatever. Um, and Rufus says, okay, let's kind of attune you to that and let's figure out a way to do it correctly, right? That might be reducing the weight, whatever it is. It might be doing a different exercise. Um, but what you guys are really trying to do is say, hey, neuron A to neuron B gives me what I want. Let's keep figuring out a way to do this, A and B, A and B, A and B. And let's figure out exercises um, that don't cause A to C to occur, right? And over time, if I just keep doing the correct squat variation or whatever, whatever it is. Neuron A and B, there's this idea of heavy and plasticity of the more neuron A fires that causes neuron B to fire, they just wire together even harder, right? And if neuron A and neuron C don't fire together anymore because Rufus gave me a better exercise or a better cue, neuron A doesn't fire to neuron C very often, that connection becomes weaker over time, right? Which is why, again, if I had a crappy coach all through middle school and high school, and then I see Rufus later on, if I've wired up A and C, which give me a terrible squat pattern or whatever, it's gonna be really hard because I've primed that up to be wired together over time. Um, so now for Rufus to change from A to B or A to C, back to A to B, it's gonna be really hard, right? So that, that pathway is primed up, it's, it's there. Um, so getting that reversal can be harder. Um, the other parts that a little more basic science-y, um, there's something called perineural nets, which are kind of like if I think all these axons are running everywhere so that neurons can talk to one another, it's essentially like glue that gets laid down uh, over time. And it's, there's more of it and it's a little bit, I'll say sturdier, you know, in, in adults and people that say are inactive. Um, so it's going to be harder to get rid of that glue for new connections to form. So, but but can it be changed because mm -hmm. of the plasticity? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the beautiful things, right? Is that there's always a potential for it to be changed. It's just how much of an input is it going to take to change it, right? So if you, Rufus, if you had a kid that, again did snatches, let's say for a year in middle school. And his coach just said, oh, cool, the bar went overhead. And then you see him a year after that, it's probably gonna be fairly easy for you to correct it, right? He's only done a year worth of snatches. Yeah. Uh, versus if this kid did snatches with this coach from middle school all the way up till he left to college, it might be a little bit harder for you to fix that, right? Because right. again, A to C is wired up really hard now. Right. Um, what what why is it that let's say let's say we you know we're teaching them how to squat and you know the, the leg strength is there let's say to do 20 kilos right and then um you know you put 30 kilos on there mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden it's it's not good the length the leg strength is there to do the 30 kilos but why does it what happens when it gets when the when you know because you add 10 more kilos or whatever whatever it is why is it that they can't do it properly mm -hmm. yeah so let's say like you said leg strength is there then it becomes a question of inputs and outputs right and i cory will know far more about this than i but like maybe i just don't have the the stability or whatever whatever you want to call it to do that now uh, but in neural wise right if the inputs have changed and those inputs 
aren't set up now for me to do A to B anymore. And it says, hey, do a little bit of A to B, but I also have to do A and C now because uh, my starting parameters have changed. Uh, then that's where you start to see, you know, I can't do this anymore or the bar goes back over my head or whatever it is. Is, is that is that where the, Corey, is that where the, or Brandon, maybe you can answer this also, but is that where the breathing comes in? That's a Corey question. Is that, is that where the breathing Let's, comes in? I mean, like, you know, take, take Luke yesterday. You know, he wouldn't get his hips through and you had him do a breathing exercise, now all of a sudden he gets his hips through. So. Well, so <clears throat> the breathing wrong. exercises are designed to change the constraints of, of your system to allow for certain positions to be achieved and for more range of motion to occur through certain joints that we need to perform the movement. And so my question to Brandon is if you're giving someone's system an input that's changing the constraints to allow for more motion to occur that they may not have had, previously, say even for a long time, how is that gonna change how those pathways are set up and how they're gonna wire as you're performing the movement? Great question. Yeah, I think it becomes a kind of a context issue, right? Of, okay, now I have, again, these are not things I even think about. So Corey, you can yell at me if I like misspeak. All right, but let's say I needed 30 degrees of internal rotation in my left hip or something, right? to be able to make this cut this way. Okay, maybe when Corey's treating me, I now have, have that, right? So my I have some input that, hey, look, like spinal cord, you can do this now. There's, I'm getting some input from my hip, from the muscles, from the joints, everything. But hey, you can do this now. Now it's a matter of figuring out a way to allow that new input to be integrated into all this old stuff that overlies it. Right. So Rufus, that's kind of the same thing of, you know, if you have a kid that had a terrible snatch, comes in, you fix it, and he's able to use, you know, the PVC or a light bar, and it looks great. And then as soon as you throw on some weight that's decently heavy or challenging, it all goes to crap again. All right. The same thing of, okay, if I, Rufus has given me these inputs, but now how do I integrate these new inputs into all this old stuff? that's been patterned there for a long time. And when I say patterned, I don't mean like my ribs are shifted up. I mean like neurons firing together patterns. Um, so then that's, that's where you guys have the harder job, I think of how do I give this person the right context to do this in to where they can integrate this new, oh, I can actually rotate into my hip, but I can only do that if I'm going at 50% speed, right? And then, because as soon as I go to 55% speed, all this old wiring takes back over, right? And how long it's gonna take for you to integrate that new sensory stuff into this old wiring will depend on how, how long those neurons have fired together essentially, right? And they're, you know, how old the person is, how active they are, if they have some type of injury or what have you. Well, that's, that's always the one of the big questions, right? Especially on the rehab side, if your goal is to increase someone's movement options or ability to get into certain positions or move through certain spaces, um, they may be able to do it on the table or when you give them a very basic exercise, but if they can't do it when they're walking, can't do it when they're sprinting, changing directions, squatting, whatever their goals are, then mm -hmm. you're not going to create the changes you want. And so it's always like, how adaptable are they? And from a nervous system standpoint, how can we create context to give them those changes so they can do the things they want to do while still maintaining the positions that are going to just be more advantageous to either decrease pain, increase efficiency, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I think like I have to tip my hat to any practitioner of any sort of like my job's fairly easy. I just look at neurons and how they connect. Right. And then I look at it and how they connect after an injury. You guys have to take a person that may not be eating well and may not be sleeping well and may have, I don't know, may have never rotated into their hip in 50 years and may have had some ankle pain for the last 10 years and may have broken their arm, like, and then try to figure that out. Yeah. So you guys have a, a far harder job, I think, as clinicians than any, any scientist. Well, so from a learning standpoint, how much do these other influences such as like sleep, nutrition, 
how frequency play a role in terms of how likely you are to maintain those plasticity changes and able to learn whatever the new skill or whatever you're going for is. Yeah, I don't have a direct answer. I don't, there's people that study only sleep and stuff. Um, so I don't want to, to misspeak. Um, but if you think of at least, again, big broad strokes of like memory consolidation, of whether that be a motor memory potentially or a an actual memory of like, oh, I went to lunch with Rufus and it was fun. It was nice outside. Um, like that consolidation has to occur during sleep. Uh, so I imagine depending on the amount of sleep and the, let's say the quality of sleep for lack of a better term, uh, will probably play a, an influence on that pretty dramatically. And then like we know exercise increases BDNF production. So like BDNF helps neurons regrow or start to grow and form new synapses or strengthen old synapses that are good. Like, so that's definitely gonna play a role too. Uh, there's some decent evidence now that the, the active muscles can actually act as uh, endocrine organs. Um, so to put that simplistically like, okay, hey, an active muscle is active so there's some feedback you know through the the sensory nerves that go to that muscle in those joints in the skin in that area uh, but there also seems to be i'll just refer to it as like happy muscle juice that gets released into the bloodstream right and having that whatever is in that happy muscle juice probably also helps uh, like the brain rewire a little bit or plastic changes to occur better or maybe it helps heart function or maybe it I pick your favorite clinical thing, right? Maybe it helps lower blood pressure because it makes the arteries more pliable. Uh, but I think that's pretty new. Like in the last year or two, I've seen that stuff come out. So I don't have a whole ton of knowledge. I don't think there is a whole ton of knowledge on that idea yet. Going off that, any research on mood and how that's gonna influence learning and retention? Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, okay, not something I study. I can't ask my rats what mood they're in in the morning, um, but certainly it plays a role. Like, so let's say even going back, so I mentioned our surgeons here, right? They can insert these electrodes just overlying the lower part, the lumbar spinal cord after an injury, right? And the people that seem to do the best is there's two reasons they probably do very well and are able to start taking steps and walking again. Um, one is they seem to be people that were fairly active before their injury, like they were involved in sports, they worked out frequently, whatever it is. Um, and two is they seem to have like this, I'll just refer to it as a sports mentality of like, okay, yeah, I went to practice and we got after it today. Like, and they kind of take that same approach in their rehab almost of like, I'm very committed to this. I'm going to do it every day. I'm going to put as much effort as I can reasonably into this. Um, so in that sense, if you want to call that a mood, I don't know if that's motivation or however you want to term it, uh, like that seems does play a big role. And we don't know if it is the predisposition of they were just active people beforehand um, or if it is this like predisposition of, hey, I know how to do this. I've done it before for a sport. So let me just do it in that now because my rehab and me walking again is my new, my new sport and challenge, yeah. Seems like there's a lot of parallels between what you do and the principles and what we're trying to influence on the training or rehab side of things as well, which is always nice mm -hmm. when that happens. Rufus, anything else you wanna ask about that? So, So it's getting a person to, so if you're trying to get them to walk again, right? And you said that, that they don't necessarily walk the way you and I walk, right? Okay, so with the proper training or rehab or whatever it is, they could get back to their normal walking, it seems like, it's by just getting to move their legs and things like that you know, or taking bigger steps maybe in the rehab process. 
you know, may, maybe start, you know, with a walker or something, you know, and then, and then or walking on the parallel bars or whatever it is. And, and so that they, they potentially could get back to um, walking normally. Yeah, I don't know about normally, um, but there's a, a few caveats, right? So these people have a, a stimulator implanted just over their spinal cord, right? So right. this is the bone, this is the spinal cord, they have a stimulator right here in that okay. lower part of the spinal cord. Um, so you need something that is able to tell the spinal cord, like, let's get going. And that stimulator seems to do that. Uh, but just the stimulator alone, like those people don't get that much better. They're not able to take steps on their own again. Uh, if they do rehab by itself without the stimulator, that doesn't really seem to help. So, but if you couple them and you have something telling the spinal cord, hey, light up, here's some electricity, let's go. And they're doing rehab then those people seem to get better. Again, I haven't seen any people, any patients here at least, um, that are like, again, just like cruising down the street for a mile at a time. But if I was, you know, in my chair or bedridden for the last 10 years, and now I'm able to stand up on my own and walk to the restroom, like that's a pretty big deal, I think. Right, right. I would, I would just, so, so, okay. So you have a kid that is, how do you say this, very uncoordinated. He's mm -hmm. not athletic at all, right? Can you teach him to be athletic? Rufus, I will ask you a question. Have you, how athletic have you made somebody? I made them more athletic than they are. I'm just, I'm just saying that. You know, so I got a bunch of kids that can't jump rope, right? They come in, they just, they can't jump rope. And, you know, it takes me six months for them to be able to just bounce. Now they can do like a pogo jump without the rope. And then, and then you put a rope in the hand and it's, it goes all, it goes to the shits. And so, um, you know, and, and you look at him and say, well, Hang on, I'm searching for the right word here because I know I'll get censored for it. Oh, you're good. Um, um, he, he, he's uncoordinated, basically. Mm -hmm. So is that is that something not firing that we can affect and get to fire? Or <laughs> is he going to be like that the rest of his life? Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, you're kind of getting into, we can talk about this, like potential critical periods and then maybe a little bit of genetics versus environment right yeah yeah so we'll start with critical periods so this idea of critical periods comes from uh, vision research so if you take a I think these were done in cats um, if you take a cat and during a very specific few weeks after it's born if you eye patch one of its eyes um, for I forget what it is, a week or something. Uh, like that circuitry right. back from the eye to the cortex for where visual processing occurs, like just doesn't develop. Or if it does develop, it's not active. But the other eye is completely fine, right? And if you eye patch the eye before that period or after that period, that pathway is already developed because the eyes started to work. The cortex is figuring out all these new inputs and it wires up fine, right? And so with that idea of there's this period where things start to wire up, um, we can take that big idea and now say, hey, does that occur for specific movement qualities, right? Uh, let's say, and I'm completely hypothesizing here. Uh, let's say that like this critical period for coordination is, I don't know, from, three to three and a half years old and now let's say that i didn't have a good coach like rufus to do, give me exercises to help me learn coordination however you want to quantify that um so i missed that period where my nervous system was ready to learn these things and i could still probably learn them later on but it's going to be harder right yeah i got it 
Yeah, and you could say that for all different physical characteristics. Again, that's just a hypothesis. There's papers about it and books about it, but I haven't seen any like hard scientific data that would convince me that that actually occurs, but it's reasonable that it might. Brandon, you've had uh, interesting opportunities in the sense that being a coach, you're able to have been able to see things at a more macro level then switching over to research, you see things are literally the most extreme micro level there is. Well, probably not the most extreme, but getting down to it. Any specific principles that stand out to you based on your coaching and research experience that are consistent all the way from the lowest level micro you've seen to the highest level macro you've seen? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you, both of you probably know this, but like, keep it simple or as simple as you can, right? Uh, because when you try to do too many things, whether that is basic science research side or coaching wise, like you still have to do the, the right things or the simple big ticket things very well. Um, and then I had something else there, Corey. It's evading me now. Um, yeah, doing the simplest things correctly, right? I see, you know, even nervous system scientific papers that there's so much in them and it's like, okay, nobody, this is so big and so broad that, you know, nobody's ever going to be able to try and recreate this now. Um, and like doing the, or I think we're seeing a shift now, at least in spinal cord research of like getting back to more simplistic things with the thought that like we don't we don't understand what the heck's happening still right uh, and again as a coach you kind of take that and like okay i don't need you to be able to do seven snatches in a row and then go run a half mile or whatever it is like or whatever silly exercise you want to try and throw together because it's going to help with balance and coordination and strength all at once right i just need you to deadlift perfectly or near perfectly. And I just need you to be able to get in and out of these certain positions when is appropriate. Um, so I think that the simplistic side of it sticks out. Um, I don't know big takeaways from like basic science to coaching. Um, I'd have to think about that a little bit more. Maybe I'll send you an email late at night when I'm not sleeping so I can, this will keep me up now. <laughs> That was not my intention with the question. By You're the good. That yeah, was. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, so why'd you switch over from coaching to academia? Yeah, a few reasons. <laughs> um, one, I got, again, into like physical therapy school and they told me how much it was going to be. And then I saw, I had seen like shadowed Bill a bit at the time and then also shadowed like PTs at like your run-of-the-mill clinic, I don't know, like physical therapy A that are all kind of all around towns. Um, and yeah, since unless you're in the scenario where like where Bill runs his own clinic, um, I thought that most therapists in those like larger clinics that are owned and have multiple places around town, um, like they just weren't great. I mean, I'm sure they help people, but it's not like I don't get an hour with each patient like it's dictated by insurance so uh, it didn't seem again I'm sure they help people but it didn't seem like I would be making a huge impact um, and then if you're going to run your own clinic like you kind of have to be a business person so I don't like that side of it um, but between there while I was trying to figure out before I got into basic science I did work at IFAS in another gym um, around town. I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, and I think I enjoyed the science and the thinking part of it the most. Um, and I, I think most of my clients liked me, um, but I just didn't like the side of the fitness performance industry. That's like, I could be the best coach in the world and understand every bit of science and how to implement that science perfectly. But I, if I'm not a good marketer and I'm not like selling myself, like I could still not ever be successful, however you want to say, whatever successful might mean. 
so I think that was probably the big reason. And then at the same time, I worked a bit in a human lab doing some brain stimulation research and nerve stimulation research and kind of fell into working in a basic science lab. And I was super overwhelmed at first of like, I don't know what's going on with basic science. I don't understand how to grow cells in a dish and look at them and put drugs on them and figure out what might work. Um, but once you get over that, I was like, wow, I can ask a lot deeper questions and I can get to answers a lot faster now. Um, so I think I really like that aspect of like, I can go as deep as, you know, technology will allow basically to answer this question, right? So like the biggest example is, hey, I wanna know what these spinal cords or the, these neurons in the spinal cord connect to. Like I can't do that in humans, right? But if I have a, an animal model, I can put viruses in there that make these specific neurons light up green then make the neurons that connect to them light up red. And then I can look through the whole nervous system and say, oh, cool, now I understand this, right? Um, so getting to like that ground, I'll say ground truth, like understanding of this particular thing, I think was super appealing to me. Um, again, I, I really liked most of my clients and working with them. It was again, just, do I wanna end up having to be a business person to try and run my own gym? Or, you know, do I want to figure out how to market myself? Um, and there's still a bit of that in science, but it's your merit really comes from how good of a scientist and thinker you are rather than am I a good marketer uh, or something like that. You had to think differently being on the research side now versus being a coach. <laughs> um, I think my thought process, and this is something I really credit you know, being around like Rufus and Bill and Ty and Jay and Lance in that period of time. Uh, before that, my thought process and thinking through problems I thought was fairly rudimentary. Uh, but I've taken like the way I think, like where we would just sit and hang out and be like, hey, what about this idea? What about this idea? What are all the possibilities here? What's the most likely possibility or what should we try with the clients? Or how should we try and implement like Ty was doing a bunch of velocity-based training stuff at the time. And how do bands fall into that? And what are all the possibilities that bands might play into this? Um, so I till, still take that same thinking. Uh, and I think that does help me a little bit, uh, at least compared to some of the other older graduate students I work with, of like, we can get very focused on this tiny little problem without seeing the bigger picture and all the possibilities. Uh, and I'm just like you have to be in the clinic, I'm not married to this one idea because of it. I'm saying, what are all these possible possibilities that I might try or might um, look at further with my research and kind of decide from there based on the current knowledge, right? And again, you guys do the same thing as a coach or a therapist of what are all the possibilities for me to do with this patient? Okay, let me test them and then let's work from there because I have a new set of knowledge to go from. <clears throat> Sorry, Corey, where did that stem from? Just curiosity. Well, oh, sorry, um, what was the question? Oh, what was the question? Oh, was, uh, has your thought process changed or have you had to change the way you think about things and how you think about things going from a coach to the research lab? Yeah, you do have to be a little more in that same breath. Like I have to be a little more niched and I think the way I present information is a little different now, right? Of, I have to be open to all possibilities of potential mechanisms to occur in spinal cord or cancer or whatever you're researching. Um, but now when I go to speak or throw out an idea or write a grant, I have to go in there with the intent of going, if I can't convince, maybe not even convince, but like get everybody at least talking about this and not thinking that I'm silly for thinking this, Right. And I have to think that on the biggest level, I have to think like the biggest big dog at Harvard that studies spinal cord injury. If he says this is a crap idea, like I don't get grant funding now. Right. If he's on that board that's reviewing that grant. Uh, so I have to be extremely, extremely, extremely thorough with my thought process. And if we don't know stuff, that's fine, too. Like there's a ton of stuff I'm sure that PT doesn't know. Uh, but it's. Yeah, being thorough enough to know 
you guys do this too, again, to know what you don't know, and then also convey that to, again, the biggest of the big in that field. Uh, as to where, again, kind of in the fitness industry of like, I could just kind of BS some things. And as long as I do it confidently, like I could probably get away with it. Yeah, well. Um, <laughs> and any, <laughs> any advice for coaches or therapists out there, things you've picked up on in terms of developing that thought process to be more thorough with your own thinking and evaluation of what's going on in the influences? Yeah, I think it's just not getting married to any one idea, right? Of like, and I'm sure because we all think similarly, like I'm not, I'm not married to any one idea. If this idea I have that I'm working on now, like flops, like we had a reason to pursue it and now we move on with new information, right? So like getting married to, I don't even want to say names of like physical therapy things, but getting married to like physical therapy brand A, because this is how they assess things. Like, okay, it might be good, but like, there's always some more stuff to go into. Um, and it's a fine line to find between like being confident enough to move forward, whether that's to treat your patient or to, for me to like say, hey, I need money to do this research. Give me a million dollars because it's important. And then also questioning yourself enough to still continue to grow, but there's a fine line between questioning yourself and then questioning yourself enough to where you go, do I even belong here now, right? Um, and that's a hard, I don't know, I kind of deal with it now of like, yeah, it's a, I question everything I do, whether that is like things that I do every day of like, why do I do it this way now? Why is it done this way and not this way? Um, or why are we pursuing this avenue based on what we know rather than this avenue? Um, and at some point, you'll, I see this a lot with older researchers um, and probably older therapists as well, but like you'll fall into a, almost a self-fulfilled trap of like, oh, cool, I know everything. So I'm like, I can just do stuff now. Um, so I think continuing to question why you're doing what you're doing and how you're doing it and not being married to one idea um, is probably the biggest thing I would take away. Uh, and again, like if I talk with Rufus or Ty or somebody or any of my colleagues here or other students, right, it's not me, you know, putting down their idea, but it's us trying to refine this idea or how to implement this training or whatever it is uh, to make it better. So it's not me attacking them or them attacking me. It's like, let's refine this together because you're not your idea. Um, it's not being married to to an idea I think is super, super important or a, a specific way of doing physical therapy or something. Anything you want to add, Rufus? No, that, that, shoot, you got, no, I, I, it, it fascinates me that you can put that little gadget thing in the spine and then you can, and then the signals, uh, you know, go to, to go and, and he can do things that he couldn't do before, you know, if he's crippled. And I'm just trying to figure out, okay, how do you apply that to sport, to coaching? Rufus wants to put it, spine stimulators in his kids now. <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't. I got to do it without them. <laughs> but if it helps, hey, I'll send them all to you. You can put a stimulator in it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, Rufus, on that little stimulator point, they're like, this is part of where human research can't go deep enough yet, uh, at least with current technology, you can't, of like, yeah, okay, this works. How does it work? I don't know. Nobody really knows. We have ideas. Lots of people have ideas of why this works, but like, we just know that it does, so they keep doing it, and people seem to get better. Uh, and then a crazy one is like, if you change, so there are these actual like paddles they put on the spinal cord and there's electrodes all across them everywhere. Yeah. Like if you change the electrodes that are firing, like you can improve their bowel and bladder function. How that works, I don't really know. We have ideas, but they just know that it does. So they keep doing it. Well, you guys are so smart, figure it out. Then, then tell me about it. <laughs> 
hopefully like five, 10 years from now, somebody will know exactly how and why it works. So it, 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 it seems like though, if we're getting back to, to sport or something, or just, I guess just daily life that there are these critical periods where kids learn things the best mm -hmm. sensitive periods, I guess. And so it, it kind of, it kind of, um, goes back to what we've always said and what we've always talked about in that, you know, kids don't get out and play enough. You know, they, they don't, they don't, I call them experiences. They, they don't get these experiences and therefore they can't do some of these things. And the only experiences they're getting is they're told you go here and here. Correct. Sure. Depending on who's coaching them. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, just, just, just going out and trying things, you know, just, just going out and just playing, you know, it seems, seems like all the things we've been talking about lead to, to the importance of, um, uh, uh, of, of having those, having developed those experiences. We, we play tag every day at the gym. Mm -hmm. They can't get out of their own way. <laughs> Ser I mean, seriously, you know, they, they make one or two moves and they get caught. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I and, you know, it's like, it's like they stop because they don't know what else to do because they've never had to experience it out in the open. They've always been told you do this and he does this and you go here type of scenario, if you understand that. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm just, so to me, it just brings back all the, all the things that, that we know about sensitive periods and, 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 and this, this idea of, and I, I don't like using this term, but of long-term development. You know, you got to go out and play and experience these things and fail and succeed. And you find out what works. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've literally had kids that make one move and they stop because they, you know, I said, why'd you stop? I don't know what else to do. You know, when they're, when they're playing tag or, yeah. you know, they'll, 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 they'll make one move and try to outrun a guy. And I got them in an area where Usain Bolt can't outrun you in this. You know, you actually, you actually got to stop and move. And we look at a guy like, like, um, uh, Barry Sanders on our, on the video that, that Corey and I found where he's getting chased and he makes two little moves and then hardly go anywhere. And 10 guys fall down, six guys fall down. <laughs> so it's like a cartoon, you know, and, and you know, that you don't, you don't see that much. Now, you know, granted he properly load and, you know, do all that and unload and did all those things, but they don't, they don't see that, you know, they, they don't, because they're told all the time what to do. Um, uh, you know, they, they don't, they don't get experience on making up their own thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it, yeah. is it am, I, am I correct in this? I mean, that, yeah. that's what I'm getting out of this whole conversation is that, is 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 that long term experience and just and just play, you know, where nobody's telling you what to do. You just figure it out on your own. Yeah, yeah, and that's like, I mean, this kind of goes back to like Corey is like, hey, you know, I get somebody to rotate into their left hip, and then, you know, I have them walk, and that I can't do that at all, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's like, how much? What can if I'm I'm going to use boxing because it's a pretty easy example for me to get through, right? So let's say I'm a, I box and, you know, I have a beautiful jab on the back, right? Fastest jab coach has seen. It looks hard. It's on right where I'm supposed to hit every time. Um, but it's all just like me doing this one drill. Coach tells me to hit the back, right? Or Rufus tells me, hey, go right here and make a cut, right? But now when I get into a game scenario or I'm actually boxing somebody, right, do I have enough experience without the constraints of Rufus saying cut right here or coach telling me hit the bag right here mm -hmm. right do I have enough of those experiences to figure out what the next move should be or for me to make up this next move on the fly basically yep yep right so that's why some of the I mean some of the best boxers they're very sound technically 
but they're so great because they're able to figure out what to do next, even if it's not the exact like technique that right. you should have, right? Yeah. They're able to, to play and kind of like figure it out on the fly, which again, which is Barry Sanders is what he did, right? I'm yeah. sure plenty yeah. of people can cut that way. If you said, here's the cone cut, I'm sure there's plenty of people that can run that fast. Yeah. But him being able to go, hey, there's a guy here, 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 and here, or for a boxer to go, hey, every time he throws a jab, I'm supposed to do this, but this isn't working, right? To figure it out on the fly then and process it that quickly just, I mean, takes a ton of inputs to figure yeah. out. Yeah, so, so I mean, that, you know, what, what you've been saying all this time is, to me is, is, is really cool and interesting. So Corey's given him the, the tools needed to do it basically you know, when, when, you know, he, he opens up their back or their hip or something, you know, so we're giving them the tools and the strength, but now it's up to you to use your imagination or, you know, and here's the technique of how to do it. Now you got to use your imagination when to do it and you can't be afraid to try it. Yeah. And that's kind of the, I mean, the beauty of when you watch Thai coach stuff, right. Yep. Of, uh, Ty starts with this very constrained thing. And I'm sure Lee does it the same way because yeah. Ty learned from Lee of like, I want you to run full speed, stop at this cone and make a cut or whatever it is, right? And then he opens it up more and more to make it more variable. Yeah. yeah like, and then he, cool. Now I want you to cut when I clap my hands or when I drop the ball or whatever it is. Exactly. And now, okay, there's this ball that drops. It's a, I've opened up this a little more for more interpretation. You have to wait for the ball. Now what happens when I put a person in front of you, right? Can we go from stop at the cone to stop when the ball drops to stop when this person cuts um, and just opening up more and more variability. I know that word gets thrown around a lot. Um, yep. but opening up the scenario to more possibilities. And that's, again, if this will take us back to the spinal cord, right? Of if the brain already or the brain stem already has this intent and the spinal cord is wired up for me to be able to cut on a dime, my brain can now take, like the brain can offload that cutting ability to the spinal cord for the most part. Right. And now my brain can work on processing the stuff that I'm seeing rather than worrying about where to plant my foot to cut. That's cool. Right? And that yeah. just takes reps and reps and reps of again, wiring neuron A to neuron B yeah. for cutting. Right. And it's not neuron to neuron. It's probably hundreds or millions of neurons, but mm. so that the spinal cord can do it or the brain stem can tell the spinal cord where it needs to cut. And I can now attune for the cortex to figure out very quickly, hey, there's a guy here, 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 and here. They're all coming at me or he's backpedaling. I need to do this next. Right. Brandon, is that like a cognitive load thing going on where if there's the connections aren't strong enough between A and B to perform that task in enough context. When you get too many inputs, you're going to default to another connection, which will give you another output or another pattern. Yeah, that's what, exactly what I would call it, Corey. Right. So if, you know, if, again, same thing is going back to if Rufus puts too much weight on the bar and this person's deadlift goes to crap, right? Uh, same thing. It's too much say cognitive load in that scenario yeah but exact same thing so i want to pattern somebody enough that the default is the good thing now right and they need a ton of reps of that and how many reps could depend again on their age on how fit they are mm -hmm. all stuff that we've yeah kind of mentioned that's, that's cool so I don't know if there's a concrete answer to this, but where does like rhythm and timing of when these neurons fire, how does that play a role into actually getting the execution you want for a higher level movement task, like cutting, sprinting, change of direction? Yeah, so if you think, this gets muddy, but we'll, I'll give my two cents at least. And if you ask 50 different neuroscientists, you'll get 49 different answers. Um, Right, so if you think that these 
once I do have this ability to make this cut fairly reliably, again, that's probably wired up in the spinal cord with these motor primitives or muscle synergies. Um, and now it's the ability to take for the brainstem or cortex, depending on how ingrained it is, uh, to say, hey, I need motor synergy number one at the left leg right now. I need motor synergy number two at the right arm right now. And like linking all of these potential movements at the limbs together at the right time. Right? And again, that just takes us back to if I do it over and over again, it's the same concept as neuron A firing with neuron B over and over again. And that just gets linked up and primed and hardwired. Uh, and then depending on how hardwired that needs to be, given the context, um, could be how variable my practice is. Then. I don't know if that answered anything that you asked, Corey. <laughs> yeah, it's always going to be, and it depends in terms of how much context and reps they need to get it. You're going to need to help give them to get the, to get it to stick. Mm -hmm. Just a matter of, I'm thinking because every cut's different. Every, every time your foot hits the ground, you get a, like a foot tap that's going to be different in terms of coordination, timing, how things have to organize. So I'm just wondering from a nervous system standpoint, what's actually, what are the subtle differences that are going on in terms of how things are firing? Or is yeah, there it might be, differences? You know, my sense would be that like you have this, again, these synergies that are for like flexion of the knee, a little bit of internal rotation, and then another synergy for like extension of the hip, external rotation, so forth. Like these things that typically go together movement wise. Um, and perhaps again, the brain or brainstem just says, do something that looks like this. And it allows enough freedom in that movement in this, probably in the spinal cord, like allows enough freedom in that signal to just decide like, hey, even though this isn't a perfect 90 degree cut, even though it's like a 95 degree cut or an 85 degree cut, like this is close enough to what we normally do. Uh, and the, I don't know where that cutoff would be right up. Like if I'm making a completely lateral cut versus like a 45, perhaps they're similar enough that like it's just one signal from the brainstem and it's the same signal and the same thousand neuron sending that signal. Or perhaps if I do go from lateral to 80 degrees or something, uh, you know, perhaps instead of those thousand neurons sending that go signal to initiate that, it's 950 of them. Like this is a part where I think just the like the technology we don't have to know yet. So we we take our best guesses kind of based on principles, but. Yeah, in an ideal world, you'd have some machine that people would just like play soccer in and you'd be able to image a few hundred neurons at a time and everybody in their whole brain and brain stem and spinal cord know what's going on, but it seems like a sci-fi movie. Let's do gotcha. it. Gotcha. <laughs> just start building one. Write a grant, Brandon, we'll build one. <laughs> I don't even know how you would do it. Right, you can, like there's, oh, seven tesla mri that is like you can image people if they're laying in these massive magnets with pretty good resolution but it's still not a single neuron you're looking at or you can't get down to the resolution of a single neuron you just kind of know like oh you have blood flows increasing here and we can see roughly where it's increasing but i don't know maybe there'll be some crazy biotech company that fixes all that not, not in a million years that I think I'd ever have these conversations. <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, because when I started, you know, nobody talked about stuff like this or that I knew of, you know. Brandon, switching gears a little bit, you sent us an article on stretching in, in rats. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have uh, any, because I know stretching is still pretty mainstream, so any insights to offer, whether it's busting some myths or just some general more concrete consensus on, consensus on what's going on with stretching? 
Yeah, so this is a cool study that uh, some previous students did in one of the labs that I work in um, with the idea that, again, we have a hospital right across the street that's treating spinal cord patients. Um, so part of this, one of the labs I work in is like extremely translational stuff. Like if we stretch rats, do they get better or worse? Cool, I can go tell the therapist to stretch people more or stretch people less depending on what we find in our rodents. Um, <clears throat> So that study, um, what was done is they developed a stretching protocol that was akin to what they do in the clinic for human patients after a spinal cord injury, but for rodents, right? So stretching the same joints for the same amount of time with approximately like the same pressure relative to the size of a rat and the size of the muscles in a rat. <clears throat> um, and when you do that after a spinal cord injury, we really didn't know what was gonna happen. As we know they do it clinically, that's kind of the standard of care. Um, but when you do it in rats, the day after you stretch them, if you go and assess their, uh, their locomotion score, we have a whole scale for these things. Uh, let's just say it, it doesn't actually go from zero to 10, but that's what we'll go with right now. Uh, if you take rats and you stretch them after a spinal cord injury, let's say they recovered and a 10 was a perfect normal rat walking. Let's say without stretching, they recover to a five. Right, so they can kind of move. You might get some leg twitches, but not great steps. Uh, and when you stretch them and you check their locomotion score again, the next day, if they were at a five and then you stretch them, it would actually drop down to like a two or a three, right? So that stretching seemed to be harmful, at least for locomotion purposes. Um, and you could reliably do that over and over and over, right? If you stretch them, check them the next day, they would go from a five to a two or a three. If you left them alone for a little bit, uh, a couple days over the weekend, and you came back, they might be at a five again. And then if you stretched them, they'd go back down to a two or three. If you kept stretching them every day, they would stay at a two or three. Um, so the mechanism there, at least the way we think about it, um, with the techniques that are available, is we can actually knock out um, some of the trip neurons, which are uh, like nociceptive neurons. And when you get rid of the nociceptive neurons in these rats and you stretch them, stretching doesn't do anything anymore. So if they were at a five on that locomotion scale and you stretch them and they don't have nociceptive neurons anymore, they just stay at a five, even though you keep stretching them. Uh, and if we look at the sprouting of those nociceptive neurons in the spinal cord in our stretch rats that still had those nociceptive like pain sensing neurons, those neurons sprout more and they sprout even further into the spinal cord, right? So they're now set up to relay even more and more pain signals. Um, so that's kind of the mechanism of what we think stretching does, at least related to post-spinal cord injury. Um, and how long you could do that for, I don't know. I don't know if like somebody had a spinal cord injury and you waited five years and then stretched them, if you would still have the same effect. Uh, but that effect is robust enough in um, our animal models that like they don't stretch spinal cord injury patients here anymore. Um, so like, again, how it applies to an uninjured person, I don't really know because um, so much changes after with the circuitry after a spinal cord injury. But to take a stab at it, you could say that you know, stretching is activating no susceptive type neurons. Um, especially if you're to the point where like, oh, this is really tight and it kind of bothers me now. Uh, whether that is causing sprouting, I don't know in an uninjured population of folks. Um, but it definitely shows that, hey, these are the active neurons when somebody's static stretching to the point of like, this is tight and it's getting uncomfortable. And why? You... Go ahead, Rufus. Why? Why can a lion be laying on the ground, see some food and jump up and start sprinting without getting hurt? <laughs> We're going away from the stretching. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, so, so they tell you, you got to stretch before you can run real fast, right? Or, or before you exercise or whatever. And how come a lion doesn't have to do it? Um, I would argue that most people now don't subscribe to that, that like you have to static stretch before. Uh, if you want to say like, 
okay, and most clients, uh, at least last I trained somebody, which seems like 30 years ago now, uh, was Not like 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned 30. We're good. <laughs> that was what, like, I don't know, four or five years ago now. Um, at least at the time, like you were doing what we called like your resetting exercises and then like slowly building to like more and more intense movements to get into your workout. Um, so obviously lions don't do that. Um, but we also don't tell people, or at least we weren't at the time, Corey, maybe it's different now and I haven't kept up with it. Like, I don't remember having anybody static stretch before they did anything workout wise. Um, it's like, I mean, conceivably, if you wanted to, like you could just get up and take off. Um, is there a potential that it causes more injury? I mean, yeah. If you haven't, let's say even primed, you could say I haven't primed the tissues, but you could also say I haven't primed like my pathways and my nervous system to get ready for this, right? Which would be more of like, again, neuron A and B firing up together. Um, and then neuron A and C firing up together. If I start to do A and B more, even within that session of working out and warming up, that's gonna calm down and quiet down this A to C. Again, fixing our signal to noise a little bit. Um, so, I mean, the other, my other thought is like, I don't know if lions get hurt or not. They probably do, right? They also don't live to 85, so. I mean, consider I could just take off down the hallway right now, right? And probably be fine. I'm in decent health. Like, I stay active. Um, is there more potential for me getting hurt? Probably. Corey, I don't know if you have stuff to add to that. I don't work with people anymore. Um, not necessarily to the lion question. <laughs> I kind of know where we're going with that, Rufus. <laughs> but no, just stretching is still pretty mainstream in terms of physical therapy and just general kind of fitness knowledge. People are still like to stretch and it does feel good. So I was kind of wondering if there was more concrete information in terms of what's actually going on when you stretch a muscle for like 30 to 60 seconds. Yeah, I don't think that 30 to 60 seconds is enough to like do much. Um, again, you might like desensitize some nociceptors or you might sensitize them a little bit more. Um, yeah, that 30 to 60 seconds like isn't enough to cause a tissue change or to add sarcomeres in parallel in muscle fibers. Uh, for that to happen, you like you need constant tension, which if somebody's bones are, if I'm 10 years old and my long bones are growing, right, there's enough tension there for long periods of time that you can increase the number of uh, sarcomeres in parallel in a muscle that's being pulled on. But that 30 to 60 seconds isn't, is definitely isn't enough to do that part. Um, and this is kind of back to the part of like, why I don't, why I got out of fitness fit is like, I don't know if my client wants to stretch a bit and it, I don't think it's going to hurt them to stretch for 30 seconds and they like doing it. Like I, you're the one paying me. So like I could try and convince you not to, but if you really want to do it and it makes you happy for that minute while you're warming up, I, okay. Yep. Yeah, there are some, I haven't read them in a while. There are a few studies that looked at people, folks that had like hypermobility, uh, but not genetic, more like performance induced. Uh, and if I recall correctly, like they had decreased uh, proprioceptive abilities at like normal ranges of motion. Uh, because it may just take like that extreme range hypermobility now for them to get enough input from a joint or a muscle uh, or fascia, if you want to go there uh, in the area, like to even have enough proprioceptive input, you have to get to this extreme range of motion now to, for you to your spinal cord to recognize where the heck your limb is in space or relative to an object. Well, that'd be my guess, right? If you just hold something long enough for an, enough times at an end range, it's going to alter how your joints receiving that proprioceptive feedback. And it's going to basically alter where in space you're going to get that feedback of like, oh, we're hitting toward end range here. Or like, mm. I have now a better idea of where I'm at, but that may come later on in the range of motion. 
Yeah, yeah. Man, I'll have to look for that study. I'm certain I have it saved somewhere on my computer or hard drive. <laughs> What's that, Roof? I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, again, I think you're desensitizing tissue or receptors over time. And I mean, this is where it gets muddy again. And you guys have a harder job than I do working with people of like, I don't know, maybe me stretching that little bit actually does decrease these receptors potentials over time. And maybe that's enough for me to feel okay for the next 35 years before I die, right? Uh, maybe it's also not, maybe it does more damage in some people. Yeah, tough, tough to say. Um, any difference in your opinion between our, so you guys used to do resets when you were at IFAST. So you have some experience with that. I want to just give a rundown of what a reset is and based on what you know now, any idea of what those resets were actually doing from a neurological perspective? Yeah, I think Corey, you probably hit on it a bit earlier, uh, right? So at least at the time, like client would come in and the very first thing they would do in their warm up was a, what we called a reset at the time. Uh, just like a very low intensity movement of like, hey, we know this person can't rotate into their left hip. So they, their first big exercise is some sort of squat. And we always see them shift to the right while they squat or something like that. So, or based on Bill's assessment or whoever assessed them. Uh, so they would do these reset exercises. Say, hey, look, like, after you do this reset, you at least have the ability now to rotate into this left hip. So we're at least starting to set you up to maybe not shifting your squat, right? Maybe we need to change the squat, which again goes back to like the context of the movement. Um, kind of what I know now, I would still think it's just stuff we've kind of talked about of, you know, I'm providing some input so that whether it's the cord or higher up structures, um, brain, brainstem, like are aware that this is a possibility now. And now whether that can utilize that possibility given the context is up to the person and the, the coach at the end of it, right? Um, so it's still just, again, inputs of providing, oh, hey, my spinal cord or maybe higher up again recognizes, oh, it's a possibility for me to rotate my hip this way now. like. But now given all the other stuff, is it a possibility in this context, right? So maybe it's not a possibility if I'm doing a barbell front squat, but maybe it is a possibility if Rufus gives me a plate and I have my heels up and I squat while reaching the plate out. Uh, yeah, that's, I haven't given it a ton of thought, but that would be my, like my neuroscience take on it. It's just again, providing some inputs. It's funny you say that because last couple of times with Bill, he's said like in passing like everyone has full movement capabilities and options on the table until you measure them and so it's kind of like oh, the possibilities are all there from a constraint standpoint because you have a body and that body is going to follow certain constraints and then once you measure them and start to get an idea of what they're capable of just statically laying there it gives mm -hmm. you a sense of what they can probably do upright against gravity and your job is to figure out if they need some type of other input to help them find these other positions and maybe get into different ranges of motion that's going to be beneficial from like an exercise form standpoint or from a pain standpoint. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. So that's made me think of, I think I gave a presentation on this at like a exercise conference or something. Um, like what really constrains movement, right? Is it bones and joints? Is it soft and hard tissues? Um, or is it like a neural constraint of my nervous system doesn't know what to do. So this is a default and it seems to work, but sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's not. Um, and there's some studies, if you look up, it's called enslavement and they actually do it on um, the fingers. So if you look at the degrees of freedom in the fingers, um, you know exactly how each joint should be able to move given just the biomechanics of the muscles, the tendons and the joints, All right? There's, I don't know, let's say five degrees of freedom in each finger or something, <clears throat> All right? So if it was just biomechanical constraints, 
that finger should be able to move these five separate ways. Um, but in most people, you take them and they don't have any pathology. They don't have carpal tunnel. There's nothing. They don't have broken fingers. They have all their fingers, Rufus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you take them and you start to measure, uh, and again, normal population, they don't have access to all of those degrees of freedom, right? So it's really the nervous system constraining the degrees of freedom, like limiting the biomechanics there of what's possible to move when. Um, and I think they did a follow-up study with like very high level pianists of where they had access to all of those different degrees of freedom, right? Because their nervous system needs to have access to all of them now. Whereas you or I who aren't a, don't play piano every day and I don't plan to, right? I just need to like grab my coffee cup and I need to be able to type these buttons on my computer. So my nervous system for ease of processing has said, hey, we don't need all these degrees of freedom. Like you just need to be able to do these things. And if I constrain all these biomechanical degrees of freedom, like you can still do all these things successfully and it's easier on the nervous system now, right? And you can take that and extrapolate to people walking or running or cutting or somebody in pain of like mechanically, all of those options are still there probably. It's just if the nervous system can figure out how to do it. And again, where your guys' job gets hard of how do I put them in a, the right exercise or the right context or the right mood to get their nervous system to recognize how the heck to do this. Yeah, we'll say just on that, you may just run into an intensity threshold at some point where the forces are too much. Mm. So the, I mean, I don't have a good way to describe it, but essentially you're going to try to lock up movement to create some type of stability strategy to where it's not going to be your, your optimal cut, but in order to manage the forces of, oh, I'm moving to the, to the right here, but I have to cut to the left when I'm going too fast. The only way I can not fall over as I change direction is to lock up, create a little bit more stability before I go. And again, that comes back to the nervous system probably recognizing, oh, I'm going too fast here. I can't have access to all my full movement because I'll fall over. So I do have to constrain motion now to get out of, to be able to change direction without falling. So I guess in that case, it still is a nervous system recognition idea going on. Yeah, very quickly, how like in that, I don't know, millisecond, like what are my options right now? Okay, this is the default, do that. Yeah, so you don't land on your face. Yeah. Yeah, and if you extrapolate that to, I have a, a youth athlete who's been cutting a certain way for the last year or two because he's still figuring out his body and it just, it works. He doesn't fall over, but from a like biomechanical standpoint, it may not be the most efficient and fastest way to mm -hmm. cut. We can, as coaches, provide a lower level environment where he can now find access to these other positions that are going to allow him to cut more efficiently and be faster going in and out of that cut and just build it up. So ideally it carries over to whatever game-like situation you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to kind of summarize all of that, right? Of like, if I put more constraints on this movement or this task, you probably open up the possibilities for people to access a, a movement or a new movement, right? And then if I open up the constraints of the task, where as Rufus does with tag, right? I open up the constraints. So rather than you just cutting at the cone, same thing, I probably have some default and less movement options. And hopefully my movement options that are chosen are biomechanically sound ones that help me produce a lot of force really quickly. And I feel like we've just said this five times over and over throughout the yeah, last yeah. How long we've been on here, but it's cool because we're talking through different situations, but we end up kind of going back to the same principles on it, which is always a good sign. Yeah, yeah. That's a hard, like, I remember running into this of like, Corey does physical therapy this way and like I'll say prescribes to this brand of physical therapy and John does physical therapy this way and like they might be using different words but if everybody sat down and talked for an hour like they're probably getting at the same stuff might be getting at the same stuff differently but probably getting yeah to the same the same conclusion at some point yeah there's just often a more of a barrier in terms of language terminology and who you've who your mentors are and what you've been exposed to 
but generally we're all after the same goals and trying to do the same things, just the methods may be different at times. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the, the idea is to talk these things out and figure out where your thought process is different, try to come to resolutions in terms of how to refine your own thought process based on what other people are doing. Because you can't see the whole picture like you've been saying this entire time. Yeah, yeah, we don't have the technology to see everything. And maybe five years or something we will, but now you take your best clinical and scientific guess with the information you have in front of you. Rufus, exactly. what are you pondering back there? <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm just listening. <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating, <laughs> and hearing you guys talk, and I just, most of these, I just sit and listen. To, you know, Corey's got these great questions, and mine, mine get answered eventually. So, so I'll just Brandon, sit, sit in here. you guys, genius. One more question here before we wrap up. If you were went back to coaching now after being in a research lab, would you do anything differently just having that different experience? Yeah, I think this goes back to my, how my thought processes have been influenced a little bit, right? Of, I would probably be a, this may be a downfall, right? Of I might be more obsessive, but that might also mean that my clients don't get results as quickly with things. Uh, I think I ran into that a little bit before anyways, of like, okay, I could spend two months getting John to deadlift perfectly, um, or does it need to be an A plus of a deadlift? Like, if it looks like a B minus, can we just start throwing weight on so John feels good? I mean, the scientist in me goes, no, like, let's do it perfectly. Let's get the details right, because that's what I have to do now. Uh, but then, yeah, your, the practitioner side has to go, like, I, how good's good enough, I guess. Um, I would probably be, and I don't think I did a bad job of this, uh, but being critical of myself, you can always do better. I think I would have tried to like connect with my clients a bit more. Uh, I see how important that is, even though I like, I literally work with rats, right? Or cells and dishes, or me connecting with other researchers like is what paves the way forward for better science to occur. So I think, you know, connecting with my clients, even more and understanding like, hey, these people also have lives going on um, of like, you know, John has three kids at home and when he gets home, he doesn't go to sleep till 1 a.m. Like figuring out all those little bits that might play into me training John, uh, I think are important because you have to navigate those types of things in science too of like, okay, Professor A doesn't really like this, or Professor A only responds if I uh, talk to he or she in this way. Um, I think I probably would have done a, a little bit better job of the, the personal side of it and figuring out how to navigate those things. Again, I don't think I like made my clients angry or they hated coming to see me, but you know, being self-critical as we should be, uh, I probably would have pushed that a little more. Um, and, Jay Chung is the king of that. So I probably would have bought Jay more coffee. And uh, it's, you, it's, it's like I tell people all the time, you got to be able to read the, the client or the room. You know, what's the mood? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I did this with Kristen one day. Um, she come in, she's tired, you know, I just kick soccer ball against the wall. She started doing it got lost in it, did it for like 45 minutes, had a great sweat going. And I said, there's your workout. She goes, Oh, I feel so much better. You know, she was just trashed from whatever work, you know, she was doing that day at work. And you got, you got to be able to, 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 to give that up a little bit or give up what you had planned a little bit to, um, um, to take, to, to take, take those things into account. You know, I think I, that's, that's, that's very important. You know, you know, you, you guys have seen me or, you know, heard me talk about, you know, kids that come in and they may be playing a game and they get so lost and I just let them play the game, <laughs> you know, and that may be what they needed for that day. I had a tough day at school, you know, and stuff. And they did, they don't, they don't need me harping at them. 
mm-hmm. that that day. And I think that's you know that's that, that that's that's very important to me anyway. And, uh, yeah, I think those those people management skills, like I, I would have focused more on, I think, because uh, I see the importance of them now. Of you know, so, scientists are all freaking weird in their own right individually right we all have these little quirks about us because we sit in a lab all day and don't talk to anybody um and like figuring out how to navigate those relationships with people who are a little quirky um i think i would have probably done a better job of that with with clients to focus more on that stuff and i imagine that helps you get a little more buy-in from them they trust you a little bit more they're more excited to come into the gym then uh yeah. Don't, don't don't be don't be afraid you know what what the workout's not written in stone you can make adjustments to it you're not having a good snatch day then you know let's don't, let's don't worry about going heavy or you know maybe we won't even do them you, know, mm-hmm. you squat and you go home how many times we've we done that with luke uh cory all the time yeah well so, yeah it's like we love talking about this stuff and it's cool and fun, but you, you can't put it together in a way that's going to resonate with your clients or your patients. And ultimately you're going to struggle to be successful and to get through to them. Yep. I think you kind of hit the yeah. nail on the head with that. Yeah. Luckily I just give the rats Cheerios and they love seeing you come around. So it's easy. I should try that. Come on, some patients. <laughs> get some Cheerios. <laughs> I do that. I've taken that approach with, uh, we have younger bioengineering co-op students that rotate with us. Um, and they're, I realize how old I've gotten quickly, but even though they're bioengineers, they come into us with like more engineering than bio um, background from their courses. So I, I literally take the same approach of like, hey, we're having neuroscience on Friday. If you answer the question right, I'll give you a candy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it works to some degree. They all show up every Friday morning and they all have read the reading for the day. So there you a go. little takeaway from the rats. <laughs> it's a stupid little thing, but if it works, hey, do it. Yeah. Rufus, any final questions? No, nope. I'm good. That was, that was great stuff. Well, Brandon, yeah, was- thanks for coming on here. And uh, we have a free smoothies with Rufus T-shirt. We will send your way after this. So send me your uh, um, your address and your shirt size. Yeah, yeah, for and, sure. Uh, you can you can be one of the cool kids. You know, this is a guaranteed chick picker upper right here. <laughs> uh-huh.